Hello, and welcome to episode 73 of On Liberty, coming to you live from the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host, Salvatore Babonis, and joining me today is the Honorable Paul Fletcher, MP, member for Bradfield and Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities, and the Arts. We'll be talking to Minister Fletcher about his new book, Governing in the Internet Age, just published by Monash University Publishing and available, as they say, wherever fine books are sold. <laughs> Minister Fletcher, thank you very much for joining us today. Good to be with you, Salvatore. Mm -hmm. oh, your book, The Internet, may be just as big as 19th century innovations like electricity and the automobile. Is that something you stand by? Well, I touch in the book on the fact that a prominent American economist has argued that if you had to choose between the internet on the one hand or the innovations of the 19th century, electric power, telephones, uh, trains, cars, that in fact it was those innovations that were more life-changing. It's a somewhat artificial comparison, I do think the internet has really been transformative. And I argue in the book that it's been transformative for Australian consumers who now have choices about buying goods and services from around the world. It's transformative in terms of the access to information that we all have. Uh, it is transformative too, and this is probably, I guess, a key thesis of the book, in terms of some of the responsibilities of government. For example, governments have always had responsibilities in relation to the control of content that citizens can see, whether it's on national security grounds or whether it's uh, on moral grounds in terms of, um, you know, the kind of material that you can see in a movie or in a magazine. And even as community views on that have changed, still as a, from a consumer information perspective, governments provide ratings on movies and television programs. And of course, there are other legal constraints on the availability of information or content. So the law of defamation is a law that pro protects a private interest, but it, 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 you know, the interest we all have in our own reputation, it restricts people from making comments that are damaging to reputation. I guess the point is that in a world where any one of us now can say something which potentially can be seen or heard by hundreds of thousands, millions, potentially even billions of people. That's a very, very big change when it comes to all of those laws regarding content and what can be distributed. And that's just one of the many ways in which the internet is a very big deal. And one other that I touch on in the book is the way that the internet has revolutionised how services are delivered to customers in a whole range of industries, banking, insurance, travel. But it also has created big new expectations on governments because citizens rightly say, well, my bank has made it a lot easier for me to deal with them. Why is it such a pain renewing my driver's licence? And that's why you're seeing great initiatives like Service New South Wales and Services Australia trying to catch up with the private sector on using the internet to deliver services and engage with customers and citizens more efficiently. We're joined today as a reminder by Minister for Communications, Paul Fletcher. Minister Fletcher, your own government's news media bargaining code requiring Facebook and Google to pay for news snippets was very popular here in Australia, but was it fair? That is a good example of a public policy challenge that the internet has brought. Facebook and Google, the digital platforms, are enormous globally and they're enormous in Australia. Over 19 million Australians use Google every month, over 17 million use Facebook. According to the digital platforms inquiry that the ACCC, our competition regulator, was charged with carrying out a 600-page report provided to government in mid-2019, and one of its recommendations was that there ought to be a code regulating the dealings between the digital platforms and Australian news media businesses, companies like Nine Entertainment Limited, Seven West Media, and indeed the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The policy rationale for that is that 
The digital platforms use content generated and paid for by Australian news media businesses. It might be a 90 second clip taken from a news program. Now that costs money to produce. It costs money to employ journalists, uh, to maintain editorial standards and so on. And yet the digital platforms are very successfully using that content to attract people to their platforms. They monetize uh, those eyeballs very successfully. And so the policy argument here was essentially a competition policy argument that Google and Facebook on the one hand are competing with traditional media businesses in the very large and rapidly growing market for digital advertising. At the same time, they're using content generated by those commercial news media businesses without paying for it, without agreeing the terms on which they pay for it. So the approach of the news media bargaining code, uh, it was a legislative, legislatively established code. And what it seeks to do is engage in the minimum necessary regulatory intervention. And the basic principle is Google and Facebook should commercially negotiate with news businesses for the use of their content. And if they don't, those news media businesses can initiate a formal bargaining process under the Act and Google and Facebook are required by law to participate in that. Now, what this has stimulated is a lot of commercial deals being done, some 14 by Google, 11 by Facebook with news media businesses. That's generating payment for content. It's generating uh, monies which will pay for public interest journalism. But very importantly, uh, we've been able to encourage these deals to occur commercially. We've responded to a market failure and we've done so in a way which uh, involves just enough regulatory intervention to get the outcome and no more. But uh, I mean, a liberal, a small L liberal might argue that the market failure is entirely in the opposite direction. Uh, those Australian media organizations are desperate for Google and Facebook to feature their content in a free market they might actually be paying Google and Facebook to feature their content, not the other way around. Isn't this just government you know, putting its thumb on the scales of the market to benefit Australia? We looked at this problem very carefully and we looked at it through a competition policy lens. We asked our competition policy regulator, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, to investigate, to analyse and to make recommendations. And what our regulator found using very orthodox traditional competition policy principles, what in the US are known as antitrust principles. It found that Google and Facebook have substantial market power. That's a, that's a specific defined term in our competition legislation. And it was appropriate that there be policy intervention. And it's a well accepted principle that if you have enormously powerful companies with very large market share and with the unique economic characteristics that Google and Facebook and the digital platforms have, which is essentially ever increasing returns to scale. So that as these global behemoths compete in individual geographic markets, it's near impossible for incumbent media businesses to compete with them. That's undesirable economically. Of course, it's also undesirable culturally and in terms of a diverse media landscape, which is an important policy objective in a liberal democracy. So at base, this was a competition policy response to a competition policy problem. But we also had regard to issues of media diversity and the importance of a diverse media in a liberal democracy. We, again, we're talking to Minister Paul Fletcher about his new book, Governing in the Internet, Internet Age, from Monash University Publishing. Minister Fletcher, a lot of your book focuses on, well, a morally difficult area that, uh, well, people have called revenge porn, but uh, a more polite and a, a, a more value neutral term would be, uh, I think you use re revenge images or uh, mm. doctored images, you know, situations where people seriously harm others by publishing images of them, which may be doctored or fake, uh, to harm their reputations or even to hurt them personally. Now, I know that your government has done a lot in the area of e-safety, electronic safety, and there's even a now a new 2021 
Online Safety Act. Can you walk us through what the intention of the Online Safety Act is and what you hope to solve with this new legislation? That example you give of revenge porn or the unauthorized sharing of intimate images is a very good example of a new set of policy challenges that the internet has generated. And let me start by being very clear, and I emphasize this in the book, I'm a strong believer that the internet is a net positive for humanity. In economic terms, in social terms, uh, we're better informed, we have more economic choices, but it also brings with it some new problems. And if you'd said to people in any country around the world 20 years ago, we are gonna have a problem in which people uh, overwhelmingly women and girls uh, can find themselves in the acutely uh, embarrassing, but more than embarrassing, the devastating situation of having uh, images of them uh, nude or engaged in sexual activity, either real or faked, being disseminated in a way that their schoolmates, their parents, their teachers, their workmates, their neighbours can see, that's just a problem that could not have existed 20 years ago. And I spend some time in the book talking about the different aspects of the internet. When we say the internet has exploded, what does that mean? It certainly means the World Wide Web and the innovation that Tim Berners-Lee developed in the late 80s. But I talk about the fact that a major contributor also to this scale of innovation is the smartphone. And the fact that we all now carry a device that can take high resolution pictures and videos and that you can use that device to post or publish those uh, pictures and videos to an audience that's potentially billions of people instantly. That's, That's a phenomenal transformation. And in the main, again, it's a force for good. I note in the book that, you know, we're now all citizen journalists and this makes it harder for authoritarian regimes to conceal from scrutiny uh, undesirable things that are happening. But at the same time, it does present some new challenges. So the whole field of online safety or internet safety, the principle we've articulated as a government in Australia, the Morrison government has articulated, is that we believe the rule of law should apply online as well as offline. Now that may not sound like a very controversial proposition, that when you interact in the digital town square, you have the protection of the rule of law, much as we all expect that when we interact in the physical town square. But actually, as I cite in the book, for some years in the early growth of the internet, that was a pretty controversial proposition. There was a strong cyber libertarian strand of thinking which said the internet should be beyond the reach of government. Now, that may have been feasible when the internet was a tool used by a relatively small number of researchers and academics around the world. But once it became a mass market consumer phenomenon, that position was never going to fly. And citizens, without thinking through it particularly carefully, just expect governments will protect them. So our Online Safety Act um, extends our existing reforms we've made since coming to government in 2013. So, for example, we've had now for some years um, a measures to deal with cyberbullying of children. In essence, if you are a victim of cyberbullying, we say first complain to the platform, but if the platform doesn't take action, the e-safety commissioner, which is a body we've established, a government, a statutory office, the commissioner has the power to direct that the platform take down the content if the commissioner determines that it meets the statutory definition of cyberbullying. We're now gonna go further and extend that to uh, severe online abuse of adults. Now we've got a higher statutory bar because adults are more resilient and we've got to properly balance freedom of speech considerations. So the test is quite a high one. The content must be content that a reasonable person would think was intended to cause harm to a specified individual. And it must be content that a reasonable person would regard as menacing, harassing or offensive. But if you meet that high bar, Uh, if you're the victim of content which meets that bar, you can now complain, or when the Act takes effect from January next year, you can now complain, and the eSafety Commissioner can take that material, direct that material be taken down. So this is really our guiding principle, as I say, is that the rule of law should apply online as well as offline. 
The internet has brought many benefits, but it's brought new categories of harm as well. And we're seeking to have a targeted regulatory response to that harm uh, so that we can make the internet, uh, the internet can continue to be to the maximum extent possible a place where people can interact safely. And in turn, that's important so that we can all continue to enjoy the marvelous economic, cultural, social, educational benefits that the internet brings. Now, when I hear about an independent government commission that will protect us against things like doctored images online, I think, well, what a relief. You know, I don't have to worry about my image being used in an inappropriate way. But the second thing I think is that <coughs> politicians will start complaining when uh, a meme is created, taking their, you know, taking a, an animal and putting the politician's face into the animal and having it do something disrespectful. Uh, this kind of, you know, memeism that the internet is you know, famous for. Uh, but I don't want politicians to be able to quash political speech by claiming, well, it's an online meme and that's uh, you know, taking it to a commission. Are there protections against that sort of abuse of a commission like this? Salvatore, you, you put your point, you put your finger on really a key point here, which is getting the balance right between protecting people against vicious online abuse, but also maintaining freedom of speech. The internet in practical terms, has delivered an enormous bonus or dividend in terms of freedom of speech. For a very long time, for the great majority of people, freedom of speech was a somewhat theoretical notion. It meant that if you said something uh, that, you know, was offensive to the authorities, you were not exposed to arbitrarily being arrested and and, and, and sent to a concentration camp. Um, but for most people, the economic realities were that, that you, you really couldn't get your voice very widely heard. You had to get past gatekeepers in the traditional media. And for most people that just never happened. So the internet has created a remarkable transformation where all of us, um, you know, with the purchase of a, a smartphone, which could be, you know, hundred dollars or not much more, and a prepaid um, subscription to a mobile provider, suddenly we have the chance to have our opinion heard very widely. But of course, as you rightly point out, you need to make sure that you don't then um, uh, set the dial inappropriately in regulatory frameworks which undermine uh, freedom of speech. So that is why we have set very high statutory bar for the kind of content that attracts this regulatory intervention under our law in Australia. The power sits not with a politician or a parliamentary committee, it sits with an independent statutory official. And there are rights of appeal. You can appeal a judgment through the court system because what we don't wanna do, of course, just as freedom of speech is critical in terms of conventional media newspapers, and you don't want a government agency sitting in judgment on what, a, what is covered in a news article or an expression of opinion in an editorial, nor do you want a government agency sitting in judgment on substantive arguments. Uh, but just as we have laws dealing with abusive and offensive speech in the physical town square, you and I are not free to wander down the street engaging in vicious personal abuse. Freedom of speech doesn't protect us against that. There are offences, criminal offences. We can be arrested, we can be charged. Similarly, what we're seeking to do is set up analogous protections in the online world. But absolutely, we've thought pretty carefully about the right balance here and not compromising freedom of speech. And that is one reason, as I say, why we set a very different statutory test for our new rules dealing with serious online abuse of adults as compared to our existing cyberbullying rules dealing with children. We've set a much higher bar when it comes to adults because adults are more resilient, but very importantly, because we want to properly balance freedom of speech considerations.
Well, look, I'm not sure that uh, many small L liberals will be reassured by the idea that it will be an independent commission <laughs> as opposed to a government that you can vote out of office if you don't mm -hmm. like what they do. Uh, look, I, I want to I'm not a lawyer, but I I want to know what's going to happen when someone puts the communications minister's face on the body of a male stripper and memes it to try to get you out of office, are you going to be able to go to this commission and say, well, quash this, put that person in jail, um, you know, make it go away? This is not designed to deal with satire or political content. And again, the test in the act is a very specific one. Um, so in the fact situation you've given, um, you know, the test will be what a reasonable at, at person. Least we hope, at least we hope it's fake. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the test in the act will be would a reasonable person designed, conclude that this was designed to cause harm in the, in the example you've given to, to, a, to me as a specified politician or another politician? Um, and um, is it, would it be judged to be um, uh, menacing, harassing, or offensive. And I might say that formulation, menacing, harassing, or offensive, is already in our law. There is already a provision that deals with the use of a carriage service, which is a jargon term meaning the internet, to menace, harass, or offend. Um, so my point is uh, satire, uh, material that is, you know, political comment is, is not going to satisfy the test of the kind of thing that the e-safety commissioner has the power to deal with, um, because no reasonable person would conclude that the purpose or the intent of that was to you know, do harm to me as an individual. They would conclude that it was an, you know, an expression of political opinion, it was, it was satire, um, uh, it was part of the robust back and forth in a liberal democracy. So while I think you're right to raise that question, and those are very much the kind of questions we've weighed up in, in developing the legislation. I'm pretty confident that the way we've struck the balance will mean that, that uh, that's not going to happen. Well, I, I, I'm sorry to push you on this, but mm. I think we're all on board with menace and harass. Mm. We're, both, we're all on board with protecting children. Yep. But protecting adults from being offended strikes, well, I think many people as a profoundly illiberal position. And again, that's not what this legislation does. Uh, what this legislation does is uh, for it to apply, for these provisions to apply, for the e-safety commissioner to have the power to require that the material be taken down, uh, it must meet two separate tests that a reasonable person would conclude that the material was menacing, harassing or offensive uh, and that a reasonable person would, in, would conclude that it was intended to cause harm to a specific individual. So those are both very high bars. Um, it's not designed to, and in my judgment, it will not deal with uh, political commentary. It won't deal with you know, a robust exchange of views. What it will deal with is, is things like a, a physical threat, you know, um, the kind of uh, online post, which sadly we do see a bit of. Um, I know where your family lives and I'm coming around there tonight. Now, if you said that, um, if you call somebody up and say that, that would breach the existing criminal law in Australia and many other countries. Um, if you say that to somebody in the street, um, in all the circumstances, if, if it would be judged to be a, you know, a serious threat. Um, so what we're doing uh, is very much applying existing standards. It's a very high bar. The issues you raise, you're absolutely right to raise. We don't want to compromise vigorous exchange of views in a liberal democracy. Australian you know, elections are known for being pretty robust and the back and forth uh, between political participants and uh, within the community is pretty robust. Uh, that's as it should be. And none of that is going to be put at risk by any of this.
We're talking to Minister, uh, Minister Paul Fletcher about his new book, Governing in the Internet Age. And Minister Fletcher, we are a live program. We do have a couple of questions that have been coming in through the chat. Uh, let me just get a couple of them to you. From Advait, uh, he has a question. Does the internet age provide an edge to authoritarian regimes? And is it possible for democracies with their vision of a free internet to keep up? It's a really interesting question. And what we've obviously seen is authoritarian regimes using the technological reach of the internet and of smartphones and of you know, massively networked cameras to engage in a degree of scrutiny of their citizens. You know, this social credit scheme in, in China is one example of that. So, um, you know, there are aspects of that which are um, reminiscent of, of Big Brother and uh, being watched through the, through the screen 24 hours a day. On the other hand, what the internet has also done is uh, empowered citizens, and there are plenty of examples of citizens using uh, mobile phones to capture images of you know, police or army brutality, for example, um, in a way that um, uh, supports a struggle for freedom. So uh, it may sound trite, but I, I think it's right to say that it's a technology that can be used uh, by authoritarian regimes. It can be also used for freedom. And um, uh, so we need to understand both aspects of it. Um, Anthony has a question for you. What are you going to do about the large internet players who censor or restrict access to views that their management disagrees with? This is a really live question. And it was obviously brought into sharp public focus with decisions taken by both Facebook and Twitter about former President Trump. Now, what is interesting when you think about this issue is that actually private media organisations, newspaper businesses, television, radio networks, have always exercised this gatekeeper power. And in many ways, they exercised it much more tightly previously than is the case today as I argued earlier, in the, in the internet age, any citizen can access a platform, which at least potentially lets them have their views heard by hundreds of thousands or millions or even billions of people. At the same time, internet platforms have terms of use and just as television networks or newspaper businesses have, for example, required that articles or um, expressions of opinion have to go through their lawyers before they're uh, made available to the viewing audience uh, to deal with the risk of defamation. Similarly, the private companies that own the major internet platforms um, do have the contractual right and they exercise that right to set terms of use. Um, now, one of the live issues here is the extent to which some of these issues should sit entirely within the hands of private corporations or whether there is a public interest and a role for government. From a, um, I guess, small government perspective, you, you, you only want there to be a role for government if you think there's a clear case that uh, the private sector is not addressing the issues satisfactorily. Um, but this fits into, I guess, a theme that I argue in the book, that because the internet has exploded so quickly, that in the, as late as the mid-90s, it was a specialised tool used by academics and researchers, and then within about five or ten years, it became a mass market phenomenon with hundreds of millions and pretty soon billions of people on it. And then the smartphone took it to a new level. 
with now several billion people connected. Um, the, the companies that are very big players, Facebook or now Meta, um, Google, Twitter, a whole range of others, you know, Amazon, um, they've gone from being startups to being enormous global corporations, some of the biggest businesses ever known, in a relatively short period of time. And it's not, uh, and the consequence of that has been, I argue in the book, that both those companies and governments have struggled to define what's the appropriate um, set of regulatory requirements they have. And the questions you've touched on, Salvatore, in terms of, for example, um, where's the right balancing line between freedom of speech and protecting against online harms? Um, these, and, and then this, this most recent question, or the question we're discussing now, what's the role, appropriate role of the management of these private sector businesses and what's the role of government? Um, some of those questions have taken quite a while to be resolved and some of them, frankly, are still not yet resolved. They are very live questions. As a general principle, the Australian government has certainly assault, asserted that at the very minimum, as a, as a backstop or as a, as, that we reserve the right to impose Australian law as it applies to the interaction between Australian users of platforms and the operators of those platforms. But at the same time, we certainly see there is a, a major role for the platforms themselves in setting their terms of use and in enforcing their terms of use. Communications Minister Paul Fletcher, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thanks also to our producer, Nico Malian. Our executive producer is Max Hawk Weaver. The director of CIS is Tom Switzer. I'm Salvatore Babonis, and I look forward to being seen by you next week on On Liberty.